Welcome to the Fish House Nation podcast. We are at the St. Paul Ice Fishing Show, and today we're in the Core Ice area here, and I'm with Mark Harmon from Core Ice. We're talking about their fish houses, and this is something that we haven't done yet on the Fish House Nation podcast, but what we're gonna do here at the show is kind of go around, talk to a lot of the different manufacturers of fish houses, and give everybody an opportunity to kind of tell their story and what they want to talk about. So if there's people out there in the market for fish houses, they can kind of listen to this series and, and kind of figure out what everybody's all about. So Mark, thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming on the show and talking about CORE. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I. I'm, I'm really turned on by your podcast. Uh, I engaged you right away when it came out. Uh, and uh, I was talking to you and Trevor last night. And, sure. You know, this is cool because there's there's only a few opportunities where all of us have a chance to see each other. And right. you know, and we, as we've been setting up this morning, people come in, we say hi, and these relationships, they build over time. But when we leave the show, we go into our own lives. Exactly. And to get an insight into what people, who they are, what they're about and what they're doing has been kind of nice and it's been a warm introduction yeah. uh like i'll just i'll throw a name out there like i met troy peterson down at uh, uh clear lake iowa earlier within the year uh and i felt like i already knew him so i mean i love what you're doing i love this podcast and uh you know keep up the good work not that you need yeah, my gratification yeah. but man i'm a fan so I'm, I'm really happy and proud to be here well thanks we appreciate you listening and appreciate you being on and we want to talk to you about your brand today though sure. core ice for people who don't know what core ice is can you just tell us about what it's all about what are what are your what are your fish houses all about yeah you know what i think i could probably answer that question by taking a little walk through history is that yeah. fair yeah absolutely. you know once upon a time people were building fish houses as well the very first fish house i fished in a guy who showed me how to fish his name is uh joel Joel invited me out to the fish house he built with the buddy, and it was two by twos and old election posters stapled together, and it more or less stayed together after they put it back together at the end of the season, right? In the summertime, the roaches held it together. Oh, or the trees, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly, or the taller, stronger weeds, maybe, I don't sure. know. But it was more or less a windbreak, and there wasn't a whole lot of insulation value. You know, you're cold, you're wet, it was dark, uh, but that was real, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then once upon a time, a guy pulls out on the ice and he has this fish house that was like maybe a six and a half by 12. Somebody looked at them like, man, that guy must have, um, he must own the bank. Yeah. <laughs> then the next guy pulls out in the six by 14. And they're like, that guy must like own a few banks. And then like a guy pulls out on the eight by 16 V front fish house. And you know what? Once upon a time that blew people's mind, but now when you go to some of these major lakes, your background, it takes something really remarkable and different to jog kind of what the current thought process is and what a fish house is. Uh, and I think when you look at kind of a time period of where things went with a fish house, it was very much a steel wood or a steel and wood world, right? Steel fish houses, uh, whether it was, you know, Ice Castle or whether it was King Crow, steel frames, wood, metal siding, and something that was pretty robust that you could pull down the road that you didn't have to put the shingles back on, right? And then that was something that, you know, your, your everyday craftsman had a fair chance of replicating. And then somebody says, you know what, I think I can do this better, so I did it with aluminum. And that was kind of your first real differentiation. You went from steel frame to aluminum, and then, you know, then there's a migration to aluminum studs, and then there's some different philosophies and in insulation. Okay, so when you look at a core ice fish house, and you say, well, you guys in an aluminum house, well, I hear that we're not. I mean, we have an aluminum frame, but then we stray a completely different direction. And I'm gonna grab, a panel just to explain this we're a high density foam fiberglass and fiberglass and so we're a composite panel and that strength of that panel not only is very lightweight it allows us we manufacture our own panels we put them on a CNC router we cut them out we fuse our panels together we bond our panels down to the floor and it becomes part of the strength and rigidity of, of our frame and what we're doing is a vehicular style of manufacturing, which gives a few byproducts. One, it's extremely light. Mm -hmm. Two, it's way stronger than anything else that's out there. And three, with the products that we use, there's nothing in here that is gonna rust, rot, mildew, mold, or decay. They are completely waterproof. 
They're highly durable. It's all engineered. Like I said, cut out with the CNC router. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's different. So we're basically the fiberglass boat of fish houses. Yeah, you guys, uh, I think when people walk around the show and they look in everyone's houses, most of them look like a log cabin inside. Yeah. And, and yours really looks like a laboratory. I mean, it, it's uh -huh. a whole different deal. Um, and I think when people come by and they see it, they're if gonna- If you're fishing, right, it ought to be, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I don't say that in a bad way. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I say that in the, you know, I feel like I'm almost like an engineer in here, right. re ready to do, do my fishing. So one of the things, and I've kind of watched your YouTube channel a little bit, and you got into it a little bit, but um, the way that it's built, you had somebody that actually kind of like, just set the the oh. the hitch on, onto their the truck. Seventy mile an hour rollover, right? And, and lost, yeah, and lost control of the trailer. The trailer yeah. goes flying. Can you just kind of tell us that story, recreate that story for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it is a story that I felt was going to hit the rumor mill pretty strong, and I thought I better just address it. And so, you know, I talked to my business partners, Kyle and Jesse. Said, how do we want to tell the story so we're telling it properly? not encouraging people to do these things, right. but there's some incredible data points. You know, and keep in mind, there, there's four partners here in Core Ice, and three of them are engineers, and then there's me. So <laughs> sales and engineering, and if you've ever been a part of a world like that, there's there's mutually successful conflicts that and resolution that come out of that. But, okay, so telling the story, uh, I don't know what happened necessarily of what was going on in the guy's mind. But for some reason, he was putting his core ice on the back of his ball hitch and did not close the coupler. He probably took a phone call, maybe got a text. I mean, we've all been there before where we get distracted. I've seen people pull up hundreds of miles before to where I'm at. There's a cell phone on the back bumper and I don't know how it rode. I would never risk that or maybe a key or a screwdriver, just something. It's just yep. happened to ride the bumper fine. Huh. Anyway. He didn't close the coupler, didn't throw the chains, didn't throw the safety brake strap or anything like that. Hops in the truck, starts going down the road, hits the highways. He's going 70 miles an hour on a course. Whew, there goes the trailer and it goes into the ditch, hits the tongue, rolls and hits the top left driver's side corner panel. And I'm not sure exactly how it happened because we don't have any of that on camera, right? right? We have the damage and everything else. But I'm sure with the way that our um, our panels work, it's like an I beam. So I think it had a little bit of a flex, and it came out. But get this, with the you know, in the industry of automotive and vehicular stuff, they're not using welds on engines anymore. It's all structural adhesives, right? You know, it's it's very. And my partners could tell you all the ins and outs on that. But basically, it's really sticky, good stuff. Right. Um, and that's how we hold our panels together. And so when it hit and landed and rolled by golly or by gosh back up on its wheels mm -hmm. and the guy of course calls an insurance agency he doesn't know what to do boom you know whatever they total it out and we get these phone calls from people that see it on some salvage website sure we look at the pictures they say it doesn't look that bad we look at them and think hey this doesn't look that bad either right so we pull that in because we wanted to see it the TV did not come off the wall. I don't know how that happened. But the TV did not come off the wall. The cabinets didn't come off the wall. The extrusions on the inside and out were dented. And so we had to peel those back. And that's where the pictures kind of looked a little bit nasty. That was pulling the adhesives off. Right. But because this is fiberglass, it's easy to repair if you know what you're doing, right? But every GM dealer out there that's ever sold a Corvette has a body shop. They do fiberglass repair, so it's a very repairable piece. Sure. So they were able to go in there, refill it, reapply the fiberglass, put the gel coat on, color match it, and the thing is good as new. Yeah. You'd never know. In fact, I was just looking at comments on that video on YouTube, and the guy said, I just saw that trailer. Yeah. So I asked him, I said, where? Because I want to see that too. Right. But anyway, so it, it's, it's fascinating. It's not something we're going to repeat for testing <laughs> <laughs> but if you happen to do that we want to know every data point about it but sure. yeah yeah a scary day that actually worked out and thank god nobody was hurt yeah the other thing that you guys have shown on your on your channel is these things float yeah yeah, <laughs> so yeah. tell us about that <laughs> well, all right there there's a picture that hit the star tribune it would be a little over three years ago today uh, it was after the St. Paul show and there was a flash drive that had some pictures and we had a fish house that was out on the lake uh, that maybe maybe was or maybe wasn't being pulled by a pontoon. Look it up on Bing, you'll find it. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
we wanted to know. I mean, there's it wasn't just a kind of we had a hunch, right? I mean, we all make a hypothesis when you're in a scientific mind. Yeah. We we have a float table out here. There's certainly a story there, but I will tell you this: hypothermia will kill you. Right. So it's not a let's go out and see how well that river's frozen up the kind of fish house, right? But there are laws in North Dakota that say that your fish house has to float in order to be recover or the, it has to be recoverable and so it must float in order to take it out on North Dakota waters. Mm -hmm. You know as well as I do, they don't seem to enforce any rules right. in North Dakota. Uh, but in Wisconsin, as we grow and we learn this business, there are lakes like right around Madison. And I can't tell you exactly what those lakes are offhand, but there are lakes where it, uh, if you see some of the pictures of the fish houses and the four wheelers that they have, they have outriggers on these things, a full flotation, or you cannot go on those lakes. We have a fighting chance of being there um, because, you know, they do. And, and when it comes to floating, it's not kind of like a bobber where you just see the top. We're not iceberg floating. It's like your socks will be wet, but not your ankles. Okay. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to tell you this off the record, right? I think uh, we're on the record. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Totally off the record. <laughs> I've seen this 8025 in pictures floating too. So uh, yeah, and it's a lot more stable than the 6511. But truly, if, if people only know Core Rice is the floating fish house, they've missed years of research and science and you know industry leading technology that really make this great you know sure. um, you know some of the other little things that we've done too uh, we have uh, our, our electrical system in here has an app that you can go into your phone and we made the very first smart fish house so I can control the lights from sitting here on my phone which is kind of nice you know there's because we don't have studs in our walls because it's all composite panel I can't put a light switch here, 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 here without putting a lot of technology into the wall. Mm -hmm. But almost everybody, except for flip phone Pete and a few other guys like that out there, um, th you need to use your smartphone. You know, you have it with you. There's an app almost for everything. You can certainly sync it to the radio, sync it to this and that. And you know, we have an app here that uh, you can sync right into your Core Ice Fish House, raise and lower your jacks, turn on and off your lights. You know, it makes a big difference. You're, you're zipped up in your sleeping bag, ready to go to sleep. Boop, just turn off the lights and it's done. Or if you're getting older like me and you need to get up in the middle of the night, you can maybe turn on a light without waking everybody up, so. There you go. It's, yep. it's part of that lab theme, I think. You know, <laughs> yeah, you're you're right. high tech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what else do you want to talk about that is, you know, you said you've got some more technology. What are, what are the other things, the technological pieces that you guys have put into your houses? Well, I think uh, understanding the application of who's using our fish house is a big story. Mm -hmm. uh, when we put our fish house together, because of the nature of our larger spaces we have in our frame, you know, we bond our floor to our frame, so they work together. So that gives us longer spaces between our aluminum cross members that we can open up more areas underneath our frame. The underside of our fish house is, you know, fiberglass. That was a floor cutout I just showed you. Mm -hmm. But that allows us to um, put fish put the fishing holes, like the ones right in front of us, you could actually have a fighting chance of jigging those, right? You know, so we put the holes where people are actually gonna fish. And anymore, I don't take that for granted. But when fishermen walk in and they see that, mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's an impression that it leaves with people. You know, it's like, finally, you know, and yeah. you get that kind of conversation going. So understanding who our audience is, is a significant part of the science to bringing something to market. Um, you know, other advances that we've done, you know, perhaps maybe our magnetic bottle cap catcher you know, from our bottle opener. Uh, and, you know, our furnace systems, you know, we, we work with Truma. We didn't, techno we didn't develop the technology, but Truma is a German company that makes a Vario heat furnace, uh, burns over 90% efficient. Uh, and we could use something that takes less BTUs, but your net output is higher, but that means that you're burning way less fuel. You're using way less electrical resources in order to get that going. And with the Vario heat, you know, if, if you're in a typical fish house or anything that has an RV furnace, right? I'm not picking on fish houses here. There's a high and low limit switch. So we're sitting in there, maybe we want that temperature at 67 degrees. Well, you kind of feel it get up to about 68, 69, that high limit switch turns off. And you're like, oh, it's getting a little warm, right? Yeah. And we're sitting here jigging and we both feel that somewhere in our upper lower or upper back. I'm like, 
man, that furnace ought to kick on about right now, right? Very We've good. all said it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then boom, it kicks on. Well, it went through that high limit switch and then that low limit switch. And maybe it gets down to that 62 and it kicks back up and goes for kind of a mean uh, temperature setting. Our vario heat, it adjusts the fan so it's always at the same temperature. You know, it's a comfort level. Now, part of technology, part of different componentry, part of the things that we do, it does elevate what that mark is for the retail price tag, mm -hmm. right? But we took a risk in the market, and it was a risk that we're gonna bring out the best products that we possibly can, that possibly were areas of frustration for other people in the past, and we said, we're bringing that to market, and we're not gonna be afraid to say, this is what it is and this is what it costs. Because you know what? If you leave the Twin Cities at seven o'clock because your buddy that was supposed to get off at five didn't get off till six and you didn't pack a stuff, you leave at seven, you get up to St. Cloud perhaps, you grab dinner, now it's 8.30, 9 o'clock and then you still have another four and a half hours up to the Lake of the Woods. You get there, it's one, two, two thirty in the morning, you set up the fish house and your furnace doesn't fire, you got a problem. You got a problem. And it doesn't matter how cool or big it is, right? Yeah. Your buddies are razzing you, and they'll tear you down. And it's it's tough. I've been on the receiving uh, end of those phone calls at those times in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, when I talked to my partners when we started this out, I said, I never want to receive one of those phone calls again. There's ways to buy your way out of those problems. And that guy would have been happy to have spent a thousand dollars more on that furnace so he had heat for that maybe one or two weekends a year that he had an opportunity to get out and fish with his friends and you know that's true so well we've talked a lot about technology yeah. and getting into things i want to give you a, a little bit of time here to talk about the different models you have and kind of sure. how they range yeah. and in the different series that you have in the, with core ice perfect yep so when we first came out into the market we were the very first and only hybrid skid house wheelhouse which is very unique right so when you are our, our side our uh, side tubes on our frame and also down our center we have skis okay. so they're built into the frame so you can drop those things down and if you're pulling this with a four-wheeler or a tracked four-wheeler you know maybe a side-by-side -side or what have you our six and a half wide uh, skid trailers or skid cabins even uh, they can go out and ski and they don't high center and we've taken those things through 9 10 12 18 inches of snow they just have perfect flotation they go right up on top and if there's probably nine if there's 12 different instances of snow whether we call it sleet slush you know sure. uh heavy wet snow heart attack snow you know fluffy snow you know we have different words for it nothing's real defined in our vocabulary at least within my vocabulary i would say that 10 of those situations the skis work great those other two the wheels work good and so having a hybrid wheelhouse skid house it's nice you can get out to the lake and you can drop that house and you don't raise it back up until you go home now when that's really critical is those first few times that you're out on the ice i mean we have super light fish houses they're like 1500 pounds right so you're you're out there early you go out to that weed line that you had that waypoint point marked at last year and of course what happens that weed line moves from year to year I've been in houses in the past that they're so heavy that you just, ah, I'll just jig fish in. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll put in the time and you struggle and you go through that. With the skid house, just move it five feet or wherever that line is. You know after you drill a hole where you should have been. Sure. You know what I mean? But it, it's a process to crank them up and drop them back down. With skis, just, just zip back around and you're good to go. So we have our hybrid skid house line. That was the very first uh, model that we brought out. So that's coming into its fourth season. Uh, we found that we went to the shows that not everybody understood the benefit of having that skid house. They, they, they didn't understand that. And it's not because they didn't get it, but their experiences didn't speak to them why there's value there. But they liked our wall system. They liked our construction. They liked the lightweight. They liked what we were doing that they could see and understand to replicate their current experience. And so we came out with an adventure series, and that's what I would call our conventional frame fish house. And we make those in the exact same sizes, the six and a half by 11, six and a half by 15. And we also have a 19 in that adventure series as well. And then what we found is we aligned really well with toy, uh, with, uh, uh, power sports mm -hmm. uh, and we wanted to bring out something that we could do because of the way our wall our walls are and with our wheel well and the way that we raise and lower our fish houses we could have more span on the inside of our fish houses that we could pull in a track UTV mm -hmm. and be able to get out of it 
which was huge. And nobody else in the market has something that you could do that without having to climb up a big apparatus or go around, just pull right into your garage and you're gone, and, and you're done. Mm -hmm. uh, and we built on the ETX, which is the Adventure Trailer Extra Wide, okay? So without getting into a whole lot of details, which you could find out on our website and everything else, yeah. but um, you know, we make an 8019 and we make an 8025. And our 8025 is what we're sitting in here now. It has more sleeping and options uh, for that. Our 8019 has some other features too. We have RV features and functions and water packages in our 8025. So, you know, I don't want to take up yep. tons of time to talk about that, but we have some outstanding options for sure. One of the things you were talking about with some guys that were in here right before we started this interview though was how much room you have in here for toys. You could actually pull two quads into the one oh, we're sitting in right now. I think so. Yeah, I think so. It's a, this is over a 16 foot long garage. Right. Uh, you know, so what this was designed around or what the concept, the capability that we felt that this must accomplish, is right. the better way to say that, is a tracked crew full-size UTV. Our 8019 ATX can carry a track crew uh, UTV as well, just without the front closet. So if you have the closet, you get a regular cab, but you could easily pull that in. But yeah, a couple, you, have couple you could probably pull in three, four motorcycles. You know, it just depends on how you get them in here and configured. Um, you know, you can get a bunch of like, what are those little kitty cats? Those, <laughs> probably get about 17 of those, you know. Some but there's a lot of floor course. space. Yeah, exactly, yeah. If you're a Shriner, this is your, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> well, Mark, thanks so much for hey, sitting down with us and talking. And sure. we really appreciate it. If people want to learn more about CORE, how do they find you guys? Yeah, you know, a, a great place to find an archive of our, uh, uh, we do two shows a week. You know, we do a Technical Tuesday and Adventure Friday. The best place to find that is on YouTube at CORE ICE. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a Facebook Facebook page, which we duplicate all of that information, sure. uh, and that's at Core Ice as yeah. well. Our website is www.core-ice.com, uh, and you know there's all the contact information from there. But it sure is a pleasure to be here and be a part of your program, and I I really do thank you a lot. Yeah, thank you, appreciate it. For more information on ice fishing, check out our blog, catchcover dot com slash blog and of course you can listen to all of the episodes on our soundcloud on apple podcasts on stitcher but thanks for listening we'll talk to you next time